as a woman, Aikido is not about taking down somebody and waiting for the cops to come. It is creating windows of opportunity. Because 90% of women have been accosted. I know that for a fact. Maybe O Sensei was profoundly moved by the dropping of the item bombs. He eventually understood the human condition and he provided a conduit to transform. You can get sucked into that, but at some point you have to see if that is really victory. Hello, friends. So today's episode is about a long love of mine, which is martial arts. Aikido is first and foremost an inner martial art. That essence is placed at the forefront. And for this episode, I have the joy of having with me one of my dear teachers, Jenny Breland Sensei, is a 40-year practitioner of Aikido. She's a six-degree black belt, first and foremost as a small woman at 100 pounds and five feet tall. I have seen her having students who are 240 pounds, and really that demonstrates the necessity through which she developed her skill to be able to handle that amount of weight and strength and bigger bodies. So I invite you to join in this conversation and please share with your friends. And yeah, let's know how we're doing at Potential Paradigms. Thank you. Okay, Ginny Sensei, welcome to Potential Paradigms. And uh, thank you so much for, for being here. Thank you for having me. It's a privilege. Oh, uh, same here. Um, I mean, uh, just to let the sort of audience know, we today we're going to be talking about, in general, about Aikido and your journey in the martial arts of Aikido. Mm -hmm. um, I am your student as well. Uh, I've been training with you. You teach with your husband, um, Pete sensei at the Kotati Aikido Dojo in Northern California. And uh, yeah, I've been on and off training with you for about a year now. Mm -hmm. And it's been a year and a half since I started my Aikido journey. And for me, uh, Aikido uh, sort of found me, I felt like I was guided to Aikido after a lifelong interest in different martial arts. And uh, one of the threads for me is that I was always seeking something, initially uh, motivated by Bruce Lee movies at some point mm -hmm. early on. And as I went through different martial arts, I always felt like I was seeking something, but it was not um, right in front of what it is that I was seeking. But when I felt like I reached Aikido, um, even though I'm not able to articulate it very clearly, it seemed like I had found what it is that I was seeking. And it was my job now to bring more articulation to that and sort of polish it so it shines, whatever that is. Mm -hmm. But it was not hidden. It was the teachers and the practitioners uh, are putting it, it's available and accessible at the very beginning right. and is available, it seems like, every day when we train. Uh, it's right there. And so I'm, I've been very grateful and I think it's, it's brought a sense of joy because that which I sought has been made accessible and yet I feel like it's a lifelong practice perhaps to really bring it to its fruition um, and I, don't, I don't, do not know if it will ever be ca captured into words mm -hmm. uh, but at least there is a piece that... Uh, I just have to show, keep showing up and training, and it's it's available. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's an investment. Um, definitely don't get as much um, um, immediate gratification, although we always try to leave the students with some feeling of success by the end of the day. So, um, and you want to do that for any student anyway. But um, yeah, it's a it's a pretty genius martial art. I have to admit that's it's just pretty profound yeah and uh well one of the i would like to go into with you about your journey uh into aikido mm -hmm. but one of the reasons i was so eager to to connect with you is that you really take aikido a word that you often use is study and as i've been training with you for a year i really am learning new levels of how deeply you imbibe that word and embody it right. um, and it's very inspiring to see that there can be so many levels of refinement and subtlety into our study mm -hmm. and um, 
you you evoke that in all of your students and in in the dojo and it that makes it easier because there is a container to to in fact study do 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 that detailed study right, right. um and you also write you are an author you've written several articles you manage uh or you have a facebook group advice uh, aikido advice for women and some men yeah <laughs> but not all men but some men yes I've been thinking of changing it to Aikido advice for everybody who's interested, right? But haven't done that yet. I actually feel that uh, that uh, that's attractive to me. Okay. How okay. how that is? I think our time needs that a little little more attention. That you know, mm-hmm. we need the the feminine to to step in into um, all the roles of societal structure, policy, government. <laughs> Uh, yes. I think it's more fun that way. At least I am enjoying more to, you know, to learn and yes. uh, interact in, in that fashion. Um, so yeah, maybe maybe let's begin with your encounter with Aikido. Yeah, this is quite by accident. Um, you know, I, 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 I wish I had a good story to tell you I saw a wonderful demonstration or I read a good book. But no, it wasn't the case. My sister was the one who wanted to do it. My older sister found an Aikido class, and she wanted me to do it with her. And we, she promised me I would be her only partner, and it would work out wonderfully. Well, you know, the first thing they did when we got there is they separated us. But um, that was many, many years ago. I was 18 years old when I started. And... Um, and, you know, she, interestingly enough, I stayed, and, and she went off to college and, and didn't stay with Aikido. But I think, I think it was meant to be regardless, because I actually met my husband in that first class. And so we met in Aikido class, and, um, and he was actually the one who was really into it. Um, not me so much, even, you know, I didn't, I mean, I was always a good student, so I learned all the techniques and learned all the names like I should. Um, but it was him who was really into it and kind of thought I could either complain he's training again or I thought I'd join him and get exercise. And at first it was only exercise. Probably for a really long time it was only exercise. I was uh, doubting Thomas, I have to say because I, of my size, I'm five foot tall, and I didn't think, you know, realistically I could really do a martial art that was effective. So mm. I had my doubts. And that lasted quite some time. I'm almost embarrassed to say it, it even landed at, I mean, lasted um, even after I became a Shodan. So um, my teacher, who was wonderful, Hans Goto-sensei, Shihan actually um, was a tremendous influence. He um, he would always try to promote me because you know I was learning the material, and he'd say it's time for this and that test, which was never exciting for me. But I did it because you don't say no to your sensei, um, and um, and you progress. You know, you stay with anything long enough, you get you get good. And um, and then I finally got intrigued much later. And once it stuck, it really stuck. It's pretty amazing. But it was quite accidental that I landed into Aikido. Well, you mentioned meeting your husband, who yes. uh, you now teach with Aikido, yes. right? Yes. And uh, yeah, that's a that's a bonus in itself. Yeah, you know, it's an interesting thing. <laughs> you don't see it often. Um, and you know, I, quite honestly, we had to work on our. Our give and take, you know, um, it was a it was an evolution. I think we're in a really good place now, where we're doing it really well together. Um, and then the interesting thing is his, of course, his body type's completely different. He has really broad shoulders and he's taller, and um, and so we get to look at Aikido from a different vantage point, and we kind of come together and and share information, um, you know. And of course, our students, um, some of them are very big men. You know, and I look at them and I know that they can't move like a small woman. So I have to imagine myself as a bigger person and kind of change a little bit um, the information that I give them. But um, with Pete and I, it's actually wonderful because um, if, if a man only wants a man to give instruction, there's Pete. And if they often need uh, a little bit of 
compassion. It's there's me. <laughs> so we I cajole them, and Pete kind of is good about you know um, being a, a great teacher. Although we kind of have decided I'm the master. I mean, you know, I'm the I'm the main instructor. Let's say. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, it's been fun. I, I, what can I say? We were very blessed to have each other. And, and this art, it has yeah. really influenced us. It's interesting as well because I uh, am also your student. And I, when I started going, coming to your dojo, it was something that was noticeable. It's like I had never seen two instructors, especially a male and a female, uh, teaching together. Mm-hmm. But from the very get-go, it, was a, it seemed like a enjoyable experience a fun one and definitely that balancing as you're highlighting there is a compassion and uh, more I feel like sometimes the martial aspects usually it's Pete Sensei who is highlighting if you this the way that you're doing it has all of these mm-hmm. uh, you know martial downsides to it where you know you could get hurt and you're always there to when I'm being hard on myself to, to highlight, to take it easy. Yes, yes. So it's to have them both in the classes is really a blessing to, to oh, have them I'm, available. I think, um, yeah, it's working out great. The students seem to like it. Um, and, you know, both Pete and I like to emphasize the Budo aspects of Aikido. I think they should stay intact. Um, and then we have the other side too, you know, the spiritual side, which we try to exemplify. So actually talking about the, the Buddha side, this is in the, in the wider, uh, we could say, ether or the uh, culture. Oftentimes, uh, Aikido is seen as, okay, that maybe it's not applicable, especially in the current culture of uh, mixed martial arts right. mm-hmm. the, that I was, had some connection with because the other martial arts that I practice were always, that was a part of the festivity was to you know, see some of these sports. And it's more, actually, interestingly, it's more common in certain martial arts than others, like perhaps jiu-jitsu and Muay Thai kickboxing, mm-hmm. Thai kickboxing, uh, seem to have more application uh, there. And you were connecting that to your entry into Aikido, where you said that for a long period of time, you found it challenging because of your size. Right. Apart from being a woman, you felt like you were right. petite and uh, less in weight and while... Uh, I've been into your dojo, and some of the students are actually, I would say, two and a half times my weight, if not more. Mm -hmm. And uh, that really demands a different kind of attention. And also, it's easy to give up. Of course, literally, you were under a lot of weight. Right. Right? (laughs) Uh, Not figuratively. So, So, I think you have a very unique viewpoint then, because you went past that phase, and it really informed your technique and study, uh, what was it that was a turning point of you? Was there something unique that shifted where you paid attention to different things? Hmm. Yeah, you know, um, I think, you know, when I, we've been at this so long that I see the patterns, and then often the pattern of a student is to do Aikido the way his teacher is teaching it, and then later on to kind of question it. And sometimes people do other things. They go off to different arts, or whatever, and some of them come back and some of them do not. Um, so it's it was kind of a normal path I saw. Um, I have to say, maybe I went through that a little bit. Um, for a while I did many seminars with um, Tetsuda Sugawara Sensei, who was just an amazing teacher. He was doing his own investigation with Katori, um, which is a 600-year-old, um, six, um, yeah, 6,000-year-old martial art. Um, but he, um, he was investigating Chinese martial arts and Aikido and because um, he dabbled in many different arts. And so we were doing a lot of close quarter um, interaction at that time, physical stuff. And there was a lot of elbows and a lot of, you know, punching and that kind of. And I think I went through that hard phase where um, I felt like things needed to be applicable. Um, and I realize now that for things to actually work, you have to adhere to the principles of Aikido, and one of which is to take balance. And, you know, if you take the balance of a 300-pound man, if he's balanced on one foot, he's very easy to take down. Um, The other part is that um, 
as applied, you know, I've read many back and forth conversations with people who question uh, whether uh, keto pins are effective or that kind of thing. But really, as a woman, um, I don't question those things because as a woman, Aikido is not about taking down somebody and waiting for the cops to come. It is creating windows of opportunity. As women are constantly looking around, because, you know, 90% of women have been accosted. I know that for a fact. And so this is our reality. Our reality is if you are threatened, you are not going to beat somebody up until the cops come. You're going to maybe hopefully um, damage him so you can run. And that's really what um, my, my feeling of application is, creating windows of opportunity to escape for women. Um, and, um, and yeah, I think I could probably do it if I needed to at this point in time. And, you know, I look at a tall man who's about six foot six, you know, and I'll make eye contact with his face, but I'm already checking out his knees. So, you know, just for practical sense of if I needed to, how would I run? And you're always scoping your environment just because you're a woman. Mm-hmm. I know many women do this anyway because it's a real threat. It's, 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 it's life. And so I, I don't go into those forums where they're talking about application because of that perspective. It's a completely different perspective than wanting it to be viable for somebody who's, you know, who's attacking you. Um, I have no pretense of taking down a man mm. to beat him up. Well said. I mean, I think when you measure the efficiency of any martial art or any skill, it's important to see what the what is it that we're defining as the application or the measure. And I think I, over the last year and a half, when I started, maybe I had some question, but that was a good inquiry because it allowed me to actually clarify what is the measure of uh, success in a martial art or success in anything for that matter. What is my standard mm-hmm. rather than what I might have absorbed in right. a culture and for myself, when I look at MMA and a lot of martial art applications, like I actually do not, I'm not interested in that kind of study that wins in somebody taking victory and dominating right. another. And also the more violent and flashy it is, that is valued more. Yeah. And there are people who are cheering, cheering you on for that. Mm-hmm. So you can get sucked into that. But at some point you have to see if that is really victory. Because in most cases, when you look at those martial artists uh, later on in their years, uh, my sense has been that they are often quite miserable, mm-hmm. apart from the physical concussions and injuries and the ramifications of mm-hmm. that. So there isn't fulfillment and joy and happiness. It's, um, it's rewarding probably in the short-term sense. And in, in the, the Western society kind of embraces strength, control, power, dominance, um, and you see this all over the place. You know, we even try to dominate our, our environment. You know, we dominate the earth. We control it instead of harmonizing with it. You know, um, and unfortunately, that's a big sell. Um, it's, a, it's a lucrative. And, um, but, you know, on the same sense with Aikido, I have really gone out of my way to make my technique um, budo because, you know, I know as a woman, I'll be questioned about it. Mm. And this is just something you accept as a woman. The thing is, if you have two, women, um, two practitioners, say they're Sandan, a man and a woman, and they have the same rank, and if the man has six inches and maybe 50 pounds on her, you know, he can be good, but she has to be very, very, very good. And that's just the standard. And I, I accept that. So I really go out of my way to make sure um, my angles are very precise, my movement with the, with the weapons are very precise, simply because I want to be a contender. And I don't want to be dismissed, because as a woman, you feel, you feel that quite often. You know, it just, it's just part of the way things are. So I really, um, I, I, I up my studies so that it's efficient and I, can, I don't have to hesitate to only train with small people. I don't hesitate to train with the bigger guys. And I'm all learning all the time. 
I honestly believe the best martial art is the one with the most gifted athlete. Because the athlete, when you, when you are gifted, you have a lot of um, um, talent behind you before you take the martial art. And if you just are inclined to be faster, efficient, um, and brave, and, and you know, willing to put in the hours, you could become very excellent. And, and if the athlete picks Tai Chi, which is very uh, dismissed as well, um, you know, there's, an, there's tremendous application in that too. It's a very, um, it's very um, unseen. And, uh, you know, and sometimes we like to compare things, all martial arts, but, you know, things, something like Kyudo, which is the Japanese bow, is very different than crossbow. But, you know, there's, they might be in the same category. There's apples and oranges. So Aikido has mostly people who are not interested in fighting. I mean, of course, there's some who are. And the ones who are innovative enough, making... Um, you know, collaborating with jujitsu and refining the pins. I really admire that. Good for you, because this is really a wonderful place to go. But for me, I'm a traditionalist. I love that ceremony and preserving the history of it. So I'm not so interested in that application part. It's, it's the other part that I'm interested in. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that elaboration. Uh, I'm finding that Aikido also interfaces, part of the reason it it became interested to me in this part of my life after having chronic illness and accumulating a lot of injuries in other martial arts, Mm -hmm. um, I'm noticing that I'm more interested in yoga and meditation and transformation really. And it's taken me about a year to understand that Aikido is in fact a transformative or purificatory practice. And I, and I had heard this from uh, Nathan Sensei, another teacher that I study with, uh, that it's an inner martial art first. Mm-hmm. And although one could say that all martial arts actually come from a monastery or some, you know, mm-hmm. you grew up watching Kung Fu movies and stuff. Uh, but as I was saying earlier, Aikido, it's not hidden. The ritual, the prayer... Right. The respect, all all those uh, deeper qualities that a warrior has to cultivate uh, are available from day one. And in your case, it seems like you were, in a way, forged in, in fire to, to have to cultivate some of those things. Yeah, um, I think it, it's been good work. Um, staying in Aikido, I have to admit, many times I wanted to quit because it was quite frustrating initially at, at first. Um but staying with it, I'm glad I did. And actually, I have my husband to thank for that and my teacher, Goto Sensei, who's just always been incredibly supportive, a champion of a person. Um, and I'm so glad I stayed because I've, I've learned tremendous things. Um, the, the discipline of Aikido's, yes, it starts with the technique, you know, the kata. And you do the kata and you, you work on your techniques in class over and over again. Um, learning is a series of layering. Um, it's a series of learning, unlearning, and relearning. Um, and um, at first, your teacher will tell you your technique. You need to improve this and that. And your harmony is off. You need more extension. And then you do it. And then you remember the next time that technique comes up, you're more mindful. And, and by, by harmony, you mean the stance? Oh, the yeah, the stance, stance. Yes, the stance. And those are the general corrections you often get. Your feet are wrong or whatever. But, um, but if you stay with that mindfulness and you kind of make it part of who you are, you start to see other techniques uh, maintain the same principles and you look for patterns and, and then you learn more. You know? But if you, if you come to class and just do things by rote um, and not, don't invest in your own study, and I'm really into do your own study, um, you could progress slower, you know. So I was always curious about finding patterns so that I, it could alleviate my frustration. Mm. So, and then they show themselves after a while. Eventually, you become mindful throughout the entire class, and then eventually um, you become mindful in Aikido on the mat, period, and then you take it off the mat. Your mindfulness will follow you, into your everyday life 
And then you spend so much time on the mat blending and connecting and, um, and harmonizing. You start to do that with your family, with people you work with, or strangers in a store. Um, and it's a very fascinating thing when you catch yourself doing these things. Um, it does kind of overflow into those areas. Yeah, and I think that's that's a beautiful quality of Aikido is that the, those qualities that are cultivated, transformational qualities just flow out into the world and our interactions and yes. um, how we love, live our life. Yeah, and if you're intuitive enough, you'll pick it up. I do have to admit there was a, one student I had, who, a man who was in his 70s, and I mean, he was roughhousing with a woman. Um, she was a uh, first cue, but he was he was being pretty rough with her. After class, I, I told him he needed to maybe connect with her a little bit more, and and he was a like, he didn't understand what I was saying, and so I tried to give him the analogy of being with his wife in the store because you know I said you go grocery shopping, and he said yes, and I said do you push the cart, and he says yes, and so I said well I bet you when you push the cart you keep up with her putting things in the cart. Right, and he said, "Yes, I do." And I said, "Well, if you didn't, she, everything would fall on the floor." So um, this is what you do in Aikido: you, you connect with your person, your uke, and you only go as fast as they're able. I mean, unless you're very interested in hurting them, and that's really not part of the philosophy. He put his hands up in the air and said, "Why didn't anybody ever tell me?" Mm-hmm. And so sometimes you you think it was it would come upon you, but some people maybe not so much. You know, depending on on where they are in life. Um, so after that, after that in- incident, I thought, you know, I'm really not going to hold back. And I'll say, I'll say this should be happening. I'll say why. And I'll say bring it into your life. Because, you know, it's, you can't always guarantee people will pick it up. And even when you say it, they might not pick it up. But at least it's said, you know. Um, so I'll put it out there and see what happens. Yeah, I think it's so important and thank you for for doing that i mean you do that in your writing and um kind of circle back you've written some articles which i feel like form a a great trajectory of how you see the learning of uh aikido and development and so you wrote this series of three articles in the aikido journal of europe yes yes uh um which is a, a journal by luis bernaldo Sensei? Dick Quaris, yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, who's a very well-known uh, sensei in, in Europe, I believe. Yes. Right. So in, in, in this article, you started with the outer training, the exterior, meaning the, the structure and the form. And then gradually it, it leads you to more the inner subtlety and the inner dynamics of the art. Mm-hmm. Could you uh, say more about how does that sh- a trajectory look like, or how does it happen? Yeah, so um, like with anything, um, or at least there are many ways to learn. A linear path is, is starting, you know, um, um, very simply um, with foot A, foot B, you know, and arm C and arm D, right? And then after people get that and they become very acquainted with it, you give them another layer about, you know, making their stance good and central axis intact so their posture is always nice. Um, and, and eventually they get an outer core, you know, the Aiki body, they call it. It looks like a, a, a body that um, you can put a weapon in the hands and then you can take the weapons out and then they hold the same shape. So um, that would be your Aiki body. And you maintain that shape um, through all your techniques. So you, the hard part about Aikido is learning not to contract so much because this is just a reflex, what we do. Eventually, when you train and you keep all those ideas in, in mind, you will eventually get an, an outer core, a physical core, that looks very Aiki and very strong. And so then after you have that, we might go more internal, with your breath. We start with the breath because often, you know, the exhale will make you naturally heavy and you can feel it in your own body when you do that. You can sink, bend the knees and the knees are big because the knees do more than just bend. They absorb, they, um, they, um, um, 
redirect. They flex. They they do many things, and so you have to kind of incorporate that part of your body. Um, and then you know, integration of the body to be one whole unit is a is a, a very hard skill because we're going from the outside in instead of the inside out. And so after you have that outer core, you learn how to um, connect the segmented parts of the body because sometimes we move segmented. Um, only arms move, um, or maybe only legs move, which means you lose the um, the potential power um, in the big muscles in the back or the big muscles in the legs. So the goal is to incorporate the whole body um, and to coordinate it so that when one part moves, all parts move. Um, and this requires an, uh, an awareness and also a desire to go there because many people do... Um, Aikido quite well, just externally, and you can go on like that for years. For me, it was always a goal to find different ways to get bigger, mm. you know. And so, when my outer core looked pretty good, and I felt like my weapons were intact, and I was feeling like they were extensions of my body, the next part for me was, how do I get bigger? And I realized, okay, I kind of maxed out. The exterior part, so I went inward. I took yoga for years, 10 years. I still practice, and I learned about the spaces in the body that I never knew. I was incorporating parts of my body, like the big toe I'd never used before, which was very amazing. It was all so astounding. And then COVID came, and and um, everything shut down. So, uh, uh, so my study started going into interesting things like Tai Chi, and so I read a lot about that internal aspect. Um, and I finally found, after COVID, a master instructor. It's an amazing teacher. And I'm learning about the yin and yang of the body. And once again, the opening and closing of joints, you know, and how to lengthen and extend and, and create potential power. And I played with it with my Aikido. And, you know, it's a tremendous part of everything. Even the basics of rooting is huge. So, there, you know, it's almost like there's always a place to grow. And so mm -hmm. I feel like um, I've, I've increased a, a lot dimension-wise. And, um, and I like to study the stuff. So I've got a background in biology. So it's not foreign, these muscles. Um, and so um, I, I find it fascinating. I have a huge regard for the internal system of your body. Your body is an amazing thing. Yeah. Yes. And we often take it for granted. Yeah. <laughs> Only when it doesn't work, we're like, oh, no, what's going on? <laughs> so, Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Uh, as you were saying, you know, often we, we have either we're, we live in a culture where we are averse to the internal uh, aspects of our psyche. We're considering ourselves, you know, just as bodies and made of physical and yet, as we some of us embark on that spiritual journey, I recognize more and more that even the differentiation between the external and inter internal is unnecessary because uh, if you're very open, the external very quite quickly leads you to the internal. Mm -hmm. And uh, I saw that highlighted in the the journey as you were you were laying it out. Uh, and so. So often one of the things I noticed as you were saying was there is this body is a remarkable machine and even after partaking in dance and other martial arts, as I come into Aikido, a new new martial arts, I was like, oh, I don't really know that I my hands could be like blades, mm -hmm. right? And there is an entire new dimension of movements and possibility that becomes open when the the edges of your hands or your elbows are now a sword uh, and so I find that very remarkable that, that in a way that's a form of embodiment. It's a dimension of the vessel that if you're driving a car that you didn't even know that it has those buttons or those mechanisms. Right. And you were highlighting that the weapons allow you to, one of the principles they allow you with is to expand and not be right, right. contracted. Right. And... Uh, it, it, it has both physical and spiritual implications. Yeah. You know, the, the, the concept is generally referred to as riai, which is an underlying truth 
um, in this sense of the weapons. Um, the, the weapons are um, become part of your body. Um, that the, we learn the weapons, and right away we learn them in Aikido because we see them not as different and not as um, separate. They all complement each other. And when you, when you strike the sword or hold the jaw um, so often, your body will just naturally map the length of anything. And um, sort of like, you know, if you are a carpenter, you know where the end of the hammer is. You don't have to look. And if you, you wield the sword long enough or the jaw, you know where the tip ends. And you just feel it, right? And when you put your sword down and you extend your hand out, you still feel the tip. That's what happens when you embody the weapon in, in your body. And you become more expanded. You become bigger. And this is one of the things that actually was quite telling for me in my journey. Um, I became huge, I felt, with my weapons. And um, I was no longer afraid to train with the biggest guy in the, in the group, if I had weapons especially. Um, and, um, and that transferred um, into my body to the point where it was pretty amazing. What you see as your center line um, changed into a center wall for me. And when that happened, I was no longer afraid of doing any kind of entry because I knew the distance and I knew that I was safe, even if I kind of got brushed on the side with a gi or a punch, it, it was fine. I, I had dodged the, the movement. Um, and yeah, the, that would, that's huge. That's huge. Having the sword become part of your body and having the jaw become part of your body. In, er, in every technique, I look for the sword and jaw mm -hmm. because it refines my movement. It also aligns me so that I have my body completely behind the technique and I'm not segmented and I have every, um, every ounce that I have is incorporated behind my, my movement. And I need that to happen. Otherwise, I would be unable to move bigger people. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, quite a few thoughts are coming to me, but as this connection with uh, the bigger people I read in your article you were saying that you had to uh, master your technique because sometimes your students, out of their in the goodness of their heart, would surrender, and that surrender meant that if they are four times your body weight, that weight is now being uh, on top of you. Yeah. So you you have to learn to maneuver in a different way and um, polish your technique, I guess, to yeah. another level. Yeah, it, you can do it. You can do it. I've had many men surrender their entire weight on me. Um, I got hurt one time from it, but then you learn. <laughs> then you learn, okay, that was the wrong place to be. And, um, and you know, I also did a lot of physics in school, so I, I understand um, where I need to be to be a support when that happens and to take care of myself. Those angles are so precise, and, um, but they're, they're accessible. They're accessible to anybody. Um, and uh, and they're, so, they're so profound because now that I see things coming to an interesting place with science, you know, science is so separated from spirituality for so long. And, and now I see that science is coming around, especially the stuff they're doing in physics and quantum mechanics and, um, and, and quantum entanglement, those kinds of really bizarre things. So what happens in what we, what we studied in school, which was Newtonian physics, the physics that you can reproduce and everybody can see, you know, the A plus B equals C, it's very clear, um, doesn't happen in the subatomic world. There's a completely different relationship subatomically, and we are made of those subatomic particles. So um, in that sense, the, the, the A plus B equals C is not so clear. It's more relational. It's more in, inclined and probable, and so, but possible. So that you've got a whole different realm of study there that they're finally starting to get into. And um, I think it's... It, it's it's just fascinating. It's all there's so much out there. Yeah. 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 Fascinating. Yeah. We could 
you could dive into this uh, application of what we see now in physics, which is, or even sciences, which I also had a background in academia, and uh, it's becoming very spiritual. Yes. Uh, and you realize that it, it perhaps always was. We, were, we just got stuck with certain viewpoints and did not want to surrender those. Um, but coming, coming back to uh, the weapons, it reminds me of my study of yoga and many years of exercises. And one of the practices we would do with, uh, with one of my teachers was to expand the sensorial body. Mm-hmm. So he would make us do exercises like we'll be sitting and in a very casual way, you find an object like a, like a vase or a flower pot or something in the distance and you imagine your senses of sight and touch going around that pot and inside that pot where we were often, I'm sitting 20 feet away from that object. Uh-huh. Um, and so, and also to obliterate, as you were speaking quantum mechanics, sometimes to see that as I close my eyes and opens my eyes, what seems far away is an image and is not actually, I don't have to concretize my idea that it's distant. Uh, that actually I am touching that object through through my sense. So it's actually an intimate yeah. intimate contact. Mm-hmm. And I'm noticing the same thing as you, you said, working with the weapons uh, in Aikido, the Taijutsu, when you go to hands, those, what has been imbibed or cultivated with the weapon is now available. So you're seeing your hands as a sh- the sharpness and that your body actually does not end yes. as you were highlighting. Yeah. So it's a... Qu- quite uh, I feel like there is a magic to Aikido where a lot of these principles that we know uh, the way that with these accessories if you would the weapons Mm -hmm. um, make them more embodied like more anchored in in your body even if you understand oh we're all one and Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to harmonize with the forces but I mean I got it at some intellectual level till somebody grabbed me and then yeah. I didn't know how to embody those principles. Yeah. I think that's why it's important to um, to experience it. You know, you can know things cerebrally, intellectually, but really the learning is exper- experiential. You have to feel it. And, you know, I can tell my students forever to move with the tip of their sword and they could say, I know, I know, I know. And, but when I look at them, I see it's not quite there. And then maybe one day all of a sudden there it is. Ah, I see it. It's manifested. Finally, but you know you can you can give them all the words, but it's 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 their it's their um, study to learn how to embody it, and um, and when you do when you actually do see it, it's pretty amazing. It, it, we kind of tend to in the science world, at least when I was immersed in the science world, um, to not um, respect space emptiness so much. So if we can't see it, we don't study it. If we can't measure it, we don't really think it's there. Um, and then many times, you know, I, I worked with a microscope for a long time, and um, you didn't always see an anom- anomaly in a cell. You felt an anomaly. And, um, and you just, be, maybe because it was f- refractile or something, there was something wrong but our doctors would always say, you can't, you can't um, diagnose on a feel. I have to see it. And the most we could get them to comply is to, instead of having, this, instead of having the patient come back in a year, they would come back in six months, you know, and so to shorten it. So that was, that's what the best we could do with those kinds of situations. But we know that, um, that space in itself, it's not empty that there's information there. And we tend to, because we're so visual, we tend to just look and, and, and think we're limited by that instead of your body has tremendous wisdom to feel um, things that can't be explained and to sense and to discern. And you have the, also the ability to change your own perception. So the weapons for me not only expand me, you know, when I point it and I move it, I see a trajectory that's, um, that's a little bit ahead. It's sort of like a chess game. And so I know where the trajectory needs to go or what I need to do with my body to create it. And oftentimes it works really well with my 
with my waza, with my taijutsu, doing that kind of thing. But I, I can't really explain it to people. It's a felt thing, and I, and, and you know, yeah. it, it develops over. And uh, just to bookmark, I love how we're exploring these uh, very many words. And taijutsu are hand to, hand-based techniques. Yes. And waza is just technique. Technique, yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. So um, often taijutsu would be empty-handed technique. You don't have a weapon in the hand, but you do move as if the weapon is still there. Yeah. Uh, it just flashed to me a, a few weeks ago. I was training uh, in class and you were emphasizing at one point of as you were bu- we were building this technique, uh, you helped make a little adjustment, which was pointing the finger yes. as a sword. But the, that just subtle sense, often we use gestures, you know, it's like go there or go here. Yes. And... I'm finding that in Aikido, that uh, gesture can r- actually r- has such a radical alteration of where the force is, and it really calibrates yeah. where the energy is going to move. I, I think it's uh, having uh, another person or having multiple forces applied to you in an intense way uh, just highlight or accentuate the power of the yeah. gesture, but we're just pointing somewhere it just seems mundane it's not but yeah yeah it sounds like it's uh you know it sounds very i mean actually i heard those words many years ago by my teacher you know fingers lead the way and i am sort of like yeah 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 (laughs) until i started actually doing it more and i realized oh my god this is a profound thing Um, you send your intention out before you even move and then your fingers lead the way and, um, and it just directs the body. You're actually sending energy in a certain direction, I feel like. And, and the body will follow it. Um, and it's a, it's, a, it's a really amazing thing when you actually look at those, those little um, instructions that seem like nothing. Um, you know, and people tend to dismiss, oh, the fingers lead the way or, or the breath. You know, what's the breath got to do with stuff? You know, I'm trying to move this guy's arm or whatever the case is. Um, we tend to get distracted by that because um, our reflex is to contract. You know, when somebody grabs your, your arm, it's very distracting. And so when you say relax, when somebody does that, it's almost impossible. So, um, but it's a learned thing. And if you do it repeatedly, you do eventually learn how to let that stuff go. Um, but it is a learning. Yes. So uh, let's dive into some of these words. One of the amazing things about Aikido, I think we were talking and uh, you had actually told me about some of the subtle dimensions of Aikido as I was exploring with you. You had mentioned uh, William Gleason, who uh, then I got a book on the sort of the mantric aspect of, Mm -hmm. to to bookmark it that way, that the Aikido, a lot of the terminology in Aikido comes from deep spiritual traditions, such as Shinto, and there are others, the, you could say, shamanic version of Japanese uh, culture or spirituality. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah, you, some of these terms are often used in Aikido, that, including the word Aikido itself. Yeah. Uh, you, you mentioned the word Aiki, and that your body becomes very Aiki. Yeah. So what would that mean? Um, Aiki is like, um, you, you know, your ha- energy is harmonized. And you can move in such a way, because Aikido, Do being the path or the way, right? So you're harmonizing energy as you go, you move along, and you know you, you go out of your way to find a way to harmonize. The reflex is to when you're doing empty-handed technique is to pull or push, um, and uh, even though I've tried that, it really doesn't work. Um, and but you know my, maybe if you're bigger, it can work. But the goal is to harmonize with the body you're training with, and feel that body like the weapons, as if this body is an extension of you. Eventually, he will feel like that. And you will know him to the degree where you'll feel his back foot. And you know exactly where that back foot is. Um, and you also know um, whether or not you know, he can take a safe fall. So when, even when he's falling and you see something else happening, he's like part of your body, you pull back. right? You can, I think that it's, it's important to throw a person as it is to save a person. You never know who's going to roll in front of them, of you and your technique. Um, so you really want to be in so much control that you can throw somebody and project him out. But if something comes in the way, you can save him as well. 
So th- that much control over that part, that uke, that feels like he's a part of your body. That's the oneness in Aikido eventually that you're seeking. Um, when we blend, when we harmonize, um, the spiritual goal is to see your uke's point of view so that you can understand him and then you can redirect him to a different place where both you and he go in hopefully harmony. That's the goal. Um, yeah, and it's, um, it's, it's, it's a very powerful thing. The, the words are sacred. Um, I don't, I'm not an expert in Kotodama. Um, there's, a, there's a few people who are really well-versed in it. We used to have John Stevenson say come to the dojo uh, he's a historian. He's written several, several books. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and Kotodama is the sort of the you would could say the mantra equivalent yes, in, in the Aikido, in Aikido practice. Aikido. And he would he would actually sit us down and we would we would chant with him. Of course, I didn't understand a lot of what I was doing, but um, maybe he didn't need that to happen because it felt there was a feeling to it, a vibration to it. Um, and he asked me personally, he says, you know, he's afraid that the Kotodama um, will, will eventually disappear. So he urged me at least to say repeatedly, you know, to my student, um, Masakatsu Agatsu. So, um, so those words will never be lost. Um, and um, this true victory is victory over yourself. Yeah, that's the l- sort of the literal meaning. Yes. True victory is self-victory. Yes. Yeah. You have mentioned a few times something very unique about Aikido is the uke and the nage. The uke being the person who is receiving a technique yeah. and the nage who is giving yeah. or the, doing the technique. And uh, at one level, one could say that any martial arts or any interaction, for that matter of fact, has that uh, presence of those two roles, or as you hi- use the word dialogue in your article. Mm-hmm. And y- in your article, as you move from the outer, or your set of three articles, as you move from the outer to the inner, you actually move from the outer to the connection of the physical stature with the breath and then towards the inner. So this would be more in the inner realm. That Aikido has a sense of deep responsibility for the uke. Yes. And uh, at, a, at a superficial level, I could see that this is actually true for all martial arts, mm-hmm. right? Uh, but from my actual experience, the limit uh, that I've done other times is that you, the, the highest level I have seen is either it's a spontaneous compassion for another where I actually don't want to hurt them or I'm actually cognizant of the fact that what my technique will do to them. Right. Uh, that is not in every practitioner in other martial arts, but oftentimes it's like you got to up your game to support your uh, partner. Yes. Or your partners. That's a. I think that's a common gradient across martial arts to train well so that everybody gets sharp. Yeah. But in Aikido, this goes way beyond just that. Yeah, yeah. There's a regard, um, you know. And when you say, you know, when you bow to your partner and you train and you say onigashimas, right? It basically means do me a favor. Um, it, which is basically we learn from each other's body, which is a gift. And so the hope is that you learn, you're, this person is uh, uh, allowing you to learn your technique by offering his body to you so you can practice. So you return it safe and sound, and then you do the same for him. And that's, um, that's really uh, a, a big thing in Aikido. Um, although, you know, people still like to feel the power and the strength, and sometimes they'll be real rough with the uke. Um, eventually, the, the whole movement of Aikido is to help you learn how to be intuitive and sen- sensitive enough to be able to tell if maybe you're going too fast or maybe you're actually hurting someone. You would hope that's the goal. Some people can tell more readily than others, Um but it, it is one of the goals is to make you insightful enough and sensitive enough to be able to tell. And, um, and when you get pretty good um, you, and you put your uke safety in such high regard, you learn how to maneuver your empty-handed technique so well that 
you can go as fast as you want and know they're safe. And that's, in, that's imperative for me. I, I, I never hurt anybody, and I hope I never will. But, and I like to practice severely as well as slow. Um, so um, sometimes I like to blend very quickly. And then, you know, as Saito-sensei would say, Saito-sensei being uh, my teacher's teacher, um, you make the blend severe and the throw slower or soft. And, you know, we know that gravity works, so there's no really real reason to pound your person into the ground unless you're trying to make a point or, you know, whatever. Um, so we, we really put safety of our uke first priority in our dojo. And I know not all dojos do that, which is whatever you need to do. Um, I think that eventually... With my with my writing, I and taking Aikido beyond the mat, I see that um, the interaction between uke and nage is more like a conversation, and that both parties are doing their utmost to sense what's going on, to become as aware as they can of all the movement, so that. Um, Nage is trying to redirect Uke, and Uke is trying to maintain his balance with a destabilizing force. And so, um, and then at a certain point, when the technique um, has a crescendo, so to speak, the Uke knows this is, I can overtake this technique and make it my fall. So it's not about just throwing your body, and it's not about just throttling your Uke. There's a, there's a give and take, like a conversation. Um, and no one person is really dominating. Um, it may look like that, depending on what you want to convey. And, you know, if you want it to look martial, you can make it look really martial. But the underlying part of it that I find very fascinating is, um, is like our off the mat on our everyday life when we have a conversation with somebody. You can tell if somebody's dominating the conversation... It, it may feel good for the person who's dominating, but maybe not the person who's receiving. So we kind of encourage an interaction, a harmony in conversation. Um, and that would be kind of taking Aikido off the mat. Some people do, some people don't. But um, I like to practice these things because I, th I find them very fascinating. And, you know, I think they help me grow as a person. Um, and... I'm more interested in hearing about your stuff anyway than my stuff. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, this is such a deep train and I terrain, and I like how in in your writing, you took it from the the as a di first as a dialogue between the uke and the nage, the person taking the technique and the person doing performing the the technique, and then very elegantly you also show its ripple effects on off the mat as how these dynamics, as you use the word conversation, literally, mm -hmm. we can have conversations, as a matter of fact, in the culture, the world we live in right now, uh, particularly in politics and the environment is so polarized right now, mm -hmm. where that domination of one voice becomes, uh, yeah. uh, one group really wants to take that perspective and really dominate. Whereas in a conversation, that is, as you're saying, it's like, uh, as you said, the uh, the nages throw becomes the uke's fall yes. and what, what i liked about when you were describing that in your article that for the uke it's not a passive act yeah. of oh there is a force coming like a wave coming i'm surfing and the wave is just catapulting me down but it's in fact is a conscious response yes. uh, to that force which then later transforms but you have to take that fall to come on the other side to right. mm -hmm. uh, to change that. Yeah, it's, it's a fascinating thing, I think. Um, you know, and it, it starts with your, your own self being aware. You know, you'd like to tell Uke how to move, but, you know, it is about you first before you instruct. So you change yourself first. I find myself, interestingly enough, um, connecting with, if I'm training with somebody who's not connecting with me, I'll connect to them. And because actually it feels better. Um, and, um, and I think that's the hard part is knowing yourself so well that, um, you understand why people do what they do. So, um, 
and that that that's a reflective thing. You can meditate on it. You know, when you're first training and you're new and you do Aikido and you can't do the technique and you're frustrated, you know, ask yourself, you know, what do you do? Do you get frustrated with yourself? Do you, do you blame your teacher? Do you blame your uke who's stiff and not yielding, whatever, right? How do you react to that? And where did that come from? Um, and had you done that before in your life? And, and you start to understand yourself and your own motivations for doing things. And, you know, it's a good study. It's not always a welcome study because sometimes you discover things about yourself that you're not crazy about. But in, in the long run, it's actually good because you can choose to change or not. Um, but I think that people come in patterns. And we all learn coping mechanisms. I believe that um, every experience you have in life is metabolized by your body. And things that are unresolved will stay in the body, you know, and oftentimes we're not conscious of why we do what we do. Um, but if we spend a little time um, being very reflective and introspective, you might discover amazing things about yourself. And then, um, and then when you discover that, you may look at other people differently, you know. You have such uh, intensity with with um, that understanding that that um, you interface with people in the external world differently once you understand yourself. Yeah, I mean, just the sheer subtlety of all the what you're unpacking. And I say it's it's subtle because in the non in Aikido we're not talking. Yes. Right. Yes. But I, as a practitioner and a longtime practitioner of martial arts and now coming to Aikido, I can see, that's what I was saying when I said earlier in the conversation that what I was seeking is at the forefront mm -hmm. of Aikido, even though it's unarticulated. Yeah. It's not that it's given on a plate, right. but it's been made accessible that you can cultivate and understand these deeper, very spiritual dimensions and not just understand, but embody and walk out yes. with that understanding. So this this... I think this, uh, continuing with perhaps this theme of the uke and the nage, uh, a thought that came to me as I was reading your article and from what you were hinting at right now, that the, na the nage's throw becomes the uke's fall as a conscious choice almost, yeah. as a conscious action. And you go on to say that the, the uke, the person who is receiving the technique, um, or sorry, the, the nage, before he performs the technique, he's already, because he knows himself, he's also knowing knowing the uke. So for the nage, the responsibility is before even initiating to sense yeah. the uke. So the, the what is interesting to me is that that moment almost seems like the nage is the uke first. Mm. It's, it's a role reversal yeah. that I'm, I'm observing from the other person and receiving something before I initiate. Yeah, it's important to be able to see things from Uke's perspective um, before you even engage, right? Um, and, and you can sense many things. I mean, you can observe things, how someone holds their body, and you can get some hints of how they might move. Um, um, a lot of the times people move according to their history. Their histories are packed in their bodies, um, and I find that interesting. Um, and then, then I've through the, all the years, I've noticed that people come in patterns, and that's a, a simplified way of doing it. it. It's not an exclusive way of analyzing, but just generally, um, I've seen this body before, mm. and I've seen that body before, and I know how to articulate, calibrate myself to be able to harmonize with that body, mm. you know, and. Um, it's a very interesting feeling when you, you sense that. Um, it, when you get pretty good, you can, you can sense trauma. You can sense, you know, yeah. um, and not need to speak of it. You just feel it. Mm. Or you can sense an enthusiasm as well, you know, this overexcitedness and joy. You can feel that as well. Yeah, one of, one of the things that I'm so uh, sort of in love and enamored with in Aikido is uh, that the, I use the word container, when we're in the dojo, I feel like 
there is an opportunity to sense the essence of a person as you were saying that our histories are encapsulated in our body i sense a certain joy now to sense whomever i'm practicing with whether they be much senior or uh, you know a beginner mm-hmm. and that's an inter- that's interesting because sometimes as we were saying there, there is frustration arises for me it would arise sometimes where i felt like somebody had checked out that i didn't feel that they were present mm-hmm. as i was doing the technique mm-hmm. and but quickly now it's 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 an opportunity for me to see taking responsibility for my response that's arisen in me mm-hmm. and what what and just studying what's happening inside of me but also at sometimes in a moment of grace uh, taking that as a collective opportunity for both of us yes to see what can i shift it together in in both of us which is more fun yeah yeah uh, and all of these uh, conversations translate into all the conversations that we we have in life and um, everyone is your teacher you know, you learn from everyone. And if you decide to learn from everyone, you learn many, many, many things. If you only think your teacher is the one you're interested in, you really lose out because, you know, even the beginner is huge in teaching you tremendous things. Um, and, um, and, yeah, I think that mindset just opens you up to this constant ability and, and access to learn. It's just pretty profound if you kind of look like look at it like that it's an amazing thing it's a gift yes yes thank you for for highlighting that i think one of the themes that i feel like i'm being taught over and over and over again is uh, when i don't have gratitude is i'm noticing it's only because i was blind for a moment Mm -hmm. because it's it's things are just being given and as you're saying everybody could become your teacher if you're receptive to that and so when I have that experience, I was like, this is too much. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm just being given messages and guidance all the time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, then it's easy to be in gratitude. But then also you forget that. Yes. And then yes. it's easy to complain. Oh, yeah, you know. really easy to complain. <laughs> yes. Yeah, again, such a, such a deep topic. And I wanted to connect this perhaps with Osense's own life and background because he... Uh, earlier in the conversation, you used a few times the word budo, mm-hmm. which is uh, means martial. Yes. So the martial aspect means where it's uh, uh, opportunity or possibility of doing harm mm-hmm. or. F- yes. Yeah. So you just being aware that that a technique is not just uh, just a little bit of change of orientation and can be destructive. Yes. Yes, and that's why you should be careful because you you can hurt somebody. These are. You, you can break bones, you can break necks. And, um, but the, the benevolent part is you choose not to. You know, and you have the ability to choose not to. Um, just like you can wield a sword. Um, um, some shihans have called the sword the, the gift of life, the life-giving sword. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and the goal is never to unsheath your sword, that kind of thing, but to have it. To have it. And so, Osensei, I believe, um, was a tremendous gifted um, athlete and instructor. Um, a lot of the footage you see is him later in life, which I honestly believe he probably went through 50 years of hard practice, hard Budo practice, before he became light and relaxed, and, and some people will even call it airy. But um, so I think that it's that that, that essential um, evolution is important. I, and also to his writings, which sound a little bit esoteric to a lot of people that don't understand it. I think it's, a, it's an evolution as well from, let's say, the, the left brain into the right brain. You know, and the left brain is more linear, so maybe you begin there, you know, just like music, you play your scales over and over again before you do Im- improvised stuff. And I think later on in life, he was doing more of that improvise stuff. Um, I think maybe he was very linear for a while, and then his words now have moved into the right brain where they're more creative, and they're beautiful metaphors. But, you know, it's, it's, I think it's a process. I, if a student came to class, I wouldn't tell him right away to do the two-step um, 
as if he was his feet were skimming the blades of grass, even though that's beautiful. <laughs> and I would probably just start with yeah, move like this, you know, and okay, don't jump up so high. Okay, don't don't use your arms so much, you know. And we just stay linear like that before we moved into the beauty of it, the aesthetic of it, you know, uh, moving like. Um, um, water or moving like, uh, you know, heaven and earth, which is beautiful stuff. I love it now. Mm. Um, but I can't tell you, maybe when I was 18, I wouldn't care for the language. I don't know. <laughs> so, Yeah, yeah, profound. Talking about heaven and earth, they're always successful, the earth being under right under yes. our feet, yes. and the heaven just have to turn the head. But um, isn't it quite perplexing that as humans, we can go to wars and conflicts and completely forget that there is, in fact, we just look up. We just get lost in our head and our thoughts. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I think t the benefit of turning the head up is that you realize there's a lot more happening. Yes. Galaxies blowing and I don't know what, how many planets. and yes. There are bigger uh, things in life. And, yes. uh, and I think, yes, I think maybe Oh Sensei was profoundly moved by, I mean, he had to be by the dropping of the atom bombs to, in his homeland. I, I cannot imagine what some people must have thought that the world is completely insane. Especially in Japan where the bombs actually yes, fell. Yes, yeah. And, you know, they didn't have TV then. You didn't see the devastation. Um, for many years they said they withhold photos of it. But it's just, and I remember a description, one person said, oh, it looked like a, the picture looked like it was a, a man with his clothes were shredded. But then they realized it was his skin, mm -hmm. you know. And so that kind of trauma has to affect you. And I, this must be why he created this non-killing martial art, yeah. because there must be another option. Well, I, I think what you were saying about the atomic bombs, an image that it flashed in my mind is, I think one of the maybe good things in our times is that, like right now we have Palestine and Israel and those images and stuff are accessible. And I don't so much watch the news, uh, but I find it interesting that we, when there's a lot of innocent children and stuff being killed, uh, that we negotiate about strategy mm -hmm. and uh, logical conversations about resolving conflict. I was like, this should be very simple. <laughs> when we were kids, we wouldn't want to, uh, you know, have these negotiations done on our lives. Yes, yes. Uh, but anyways, yeah, I think, I, I feel like I, I just made a tangent, but maybe not because Osensei was in the midst, his life was in the midst of this very violent period. Yes. And from my very little understanding is that he was a sort of a polymath, meaning that he had these spiritual interests where he was studying Shinto and he was training different kinds of martial arts. Mm -hmm. And he was quite a gangster in a way because he was he was challenging and he was being challenged and a lot of these were lethal fights to right. the, you know, uh, taking out the sword, real swords, mm -hmm. not wooden swords. So uh, usually only one person goes back. Uh, so, and then there are different phases of his life and, uh, from what I understand, as you were saying, his writings are quite esoteric. Mm -hmm. When I read them, they make sense because maybe that's the realm I live in and I study yoga and the tantras and stuff and uh, the different postures of the body in, in yoga are connected with different energy centers that connect with heavenly bodies and with different sounds. And a lot of the transmission of O-sensei, as you were mentioning Tokudama, uh, and you guided me to a book, uh, that he had this revelation of the vowels and consonants that are tied to different deities and all the forms of Aikido, mm -hmm. uh, which is very tantric actually, which is very yogic okay. or Kabbalistic, yeah. you know, and even in Christianity, the sacred word, the Logos, plus yeah. there was the word and the word was one with God and so on and so forth. So it seems that he had firsthand as a warrior transition being in a violent samurai culture at the time during the time of war mm -hmm. seeing the destruction also developed cultivated himself to be very good at it and then come up with something he had distilled and i think maybe that that connects with that uke nage uh, dynamic that we were speaking of that how it without going to war perhaps that dynamic can purify yes yeah. as to not have the necessity to yeah. To do the war. Yeah, I think he, uh, he eventually understood the human condition. Um, I think that it's a, and he provided a conduit to trans, transform. Um, 
it's it's only one conduit. There are many ways to transform, but I I find it to be every time I discover something about Aikido, I'm profoundly affected by it. You had mentioned maybe to I, I know we're we're uh, we have a time limit, so one of the beautiful thing about Aikido is these very deep words that you have also used in your articles. So maybe I could reflect some of them quickly to you. Sure. Um, because I also love etymology. And so Kamai, let's take the word Kamai, which is the ready stance. Every martial arts yes. emphasizes a, a ready position or a start position. Yeah. And as a martial artist, what I understand is that it is probably the ready stance might be the most profound position of all the positions. Mm -hmm. But it can take one to go through everything to come back it's it's almost like a like an essence of course you don't understand it on day one mm -hmm. uh, just as a possibility of course there are everything else is also deep how do you see kamai in your journey well kamai is uh is the stance where you are solid grounded ready um and paused before so, and I, I also see Kamai not only as a starting position, I see it as a middle position and an ending position too. Um, and, um, and, you know, before you've even engaged, you're already um, accumulating information. You're already feeling what you're about before you've felt your partner. So that Kamai is, I give myself a moment of pause when I, when I, uh, when I assume it. Um, because um, it's it just it's a moment in time, and um, and those intervals are they're just uh, they're just full of information, and it also I I'll take the kamai off the mat, and before I engage in a difficult conversation or um, enter into a difficult situation like at work or something, I'll give myself pause before. I enter so that I can be okay in the chaos and already grounded before um, I enter. And when I leave, um, I can assess where I've been and how I feel when it's done. Um, same thing in Aikido, and that kind of goes into uh, a zanshin posture, right, where you're done and you're throwing your partner, but you're maintaining the shape and form because even though you've, you've thrown your partner, you're still connected, and it's more of a lingering mind, they describe it as. Um, I feel it's a finish that needs to, to occur. It, it completes the beginning and it completes the end. It's, it's really part of all of it. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's interesting. So as I was reading your writing and in, in my own contemplation, particularly with this term of zanshin, mm -hmm. uh, the lingering or remaining mind, uh, what it alerted me to when I heard this term was usually I noticed that when I would perform a technique, there was a moment till let's say you have done a throw or you've fallen, complete blackout. It's a checkout, even if it's a small one, a two second checkout or a three second, where I was like, oh, I was totally in distraction. Uh, and Zanshin kind of hints that you're still in that readiness. Yes. Um, and you were connecting it with Kamai which is interesting, and in your article I read that Kamai is, because often you're correcting us uh, in class and you're saying find your Kamai, that's one of the principles to follow. But even you say that even in the midst of the technique, uh, the Kamai is present. Yeah. Could you explain that? Because it, it seems stationary, but let's say if I'm moving, how would I find Kamai? So sometimes in the middle of a technique, there is a pause. There is, and I, you know, I wouldn't say, it's not a change of direction. Because there no, there's no directional, so everything is, is still connected. But often there's a pause. Usually when we blend initially, there is a little bit of an, an exhale. You contract to absorb the energy. That's a pause. So in that pause, I'll, I'll um, remember my stance. So when you get familiar with techniques, eventually the techniques become languid. And you actually feel like you have a ton of time, especially during these, these transition parts. And so I'll check my kamai and all those transition parts to make sure they're as good as it was when it started. 
And um, I think that that's um, just a repositioning, a restabilizing before we go on. Mm. Wow. When I was reading your article, and correct me if I'm wrong, in, in this particular context, you also mentioned uh, something about the pause of the breath or the transition between the inhale yeah, yeah. and the exhale. Yeah, it's an interesting thing because, you know, sometimes we think there's only two parts in the breath, the inhale and the exhale. But there is a moment, a uh, moment in between the breaths. In, in, after you exhale, there's a, a mom, an interval. And then before you inhale, there's an interval. Those moments, I think, are the huge parts of, of nurturing an awareness that's so highly conscious and um, and actually, it's a it's a peaceful place to be. I love that pause, and I wish sometimes it would last longer, but it doesn't. But they're they're nurture, they're nourishing moments for me, um, and I like to slow time down like that and see if I can feel it, see if I can languish in it, even though it's just a, it's just a moment, um, and then I go on. But yeah, I I, I make it. Um, very similar to the breath. Um, sometimes in the morning I'll meditate, and and I used to hate getting into my breath. They'd always say, "Do your breath," do your breath. and I just like totally impatient with it. But I'm working on slowing my breath down, and now the moments last longer. So and and it's it's quite it's quite nourishing. I mean, I have to say it's a beautiful place to be. Who would have thought? <laughs> yeah, well, I think a lot of people have thought that, and I was just enjoying what you said because, uh, and that that is the beauty of Aikido is that not in every martial art you will get these kind of very so sounding esoteric sounding. Right. In, in my study of uh, tantras and yoga, the the middle point of the uh, the the inhale and the exhale, the pause, is considered the doorway to the beyond. Mm -hmm and is uh, is also present in many things that shift from one to another, as you were highlighting even in the movement. So between waking, dreaming, and deep sleep, mm -hmm. these three states that we often experience, there is a pause. And they say that if uh, you practice awareness of the pause between the breath, you naturally begin to uh, find the pause between waking and dreaming, and dreaming and deep sleep. And the Buddhists, apart from yoga, they also connect it to the bardo state, which is the transition of the soul. Mm. So they say that if you have that awareness of this very pause, mm. uh, in whether in breath or in the kamaya, as you're saying, if you have that awareness, then you catch when you transition. And then your future is more deliberate by choice rather than just by flowing through what they call the karmic tendencies mm. of your habitual tendency. Mm. So I deeply, you know, for me, it just makes Aikido even more fun because uh, uh, that's one of the meditative practices that I do, which is one of the easiest ones to just find, pay attention to inhale, exhale, but also the transition. Yeah, that's, transition an, that's interesting too, because you know, when you pause like that and you, your kamai, your stance is aligned and, um, and, it, and your own body feels like it's in harmony, um, it's an architecture that, okay, I, this is it, I've got it, now I can go on. If it feels off, you know, you notice, you note it, and then you can go back to it later. Okay, what was that? It was off. But, um, yeah, it, it's very revelatory, you know, and, and there's so many things you can study in that brief pause. Wow. It's just really amazing to me. And I guess these things, you know, they have the ability to occur naturally. You know, I'll feel a certain thing, and then I'll read about them later on someplace else, and I'll say, wow, that's really, okay, that's cool, because that's what I felt, you know, so others have felt it too. So that's nice to hear about your, your the yoga and all of that. So, so, so quickly moving on, because I, I love these terms, rapid fire round, I guess. <laughs> uh, so from Zanshin, we move to Mushin, which I understand is quiet mind or empty mind. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mushin is empty or n your mind is not occupied by anything. It's nice when you can bypass the thinking mind because sometimes the thinking mind will definitely hold you back. And sometimes um, it's, it's, guys, it's nice to get in what they, I guess they would refer to as a flow state 
or you're just doing, you lose track of time, you just do. And I think that empty mind is great because it's unoccupied and, uh, and you just move uh, with your body, you know, and uh, it's the body wisdom doing it. Yeah. I've, I, interestingly enough, just to, to, um, to go on a tirade here, you were talking about your keyboard. Um, I, when I was practicing piano many years ago, we, we had to do these recitals and we had to memorize our piece. And so we would actually try to do that. And there was one time I had to do this piece and, and I lost my place in the music. But my fingers kept going. And I desperately looked for the place and I couldn't find it. And once I realized my body kept playing the music, uh, I was like really surprised. And, um, and that's when I messed up. But, you know, allowing your body just to do it, there is a wisdom there that, uh, that we kind of give the mind priority, but the body knows. Mm. And if we trust that, you know, you actually have three brains. It's not just up here. You have a brain in your heart and in your gut. And we should sense those, those parts of our bodies, too. And uh, the body is very wise. Mm-hmm. And I feel like it's less fun and takes less energy yeah exactly <laughs> i get exhausted when i'm in my head yeah no that's yeah that can be very exhausting yes so an, a very interesting word that you mentioned in your article is in ryoku oh, yes yes the attractive force the attractive and it seems like there was a quote from o sensei which i don't remember but it was that he was saying that the culmination um of the martial art is that you can attract or magnetize the opponent. Yeah, Will you yeah. say what that means? Yeah, you know that um, that um, you can draw your opponent towards you, right, by blending with that body. And, um, and since all things naturally go down, you know, the ground, the gravity helps you too. Your center line helps you too. And you find that it's an effortless thing. Um, drawing your partner to you is... Um, is something you can do off the mat as well um, by just your example. You don't have to say anything. Um, if your example is pure and sincere, people will naturally not want to know what's going on with you, right? Um, and um, um, as opposed to saying, which, which sometimes I think, you know, words aren't honest. Um, and they also impede, and they don't do, they don't do, um, they don't do justice to what I think is often felt. These attractions are felt. And um, when I draw my uke to me, I'm constantly thinking of working with gravity, working with my posture, drawing them in so that I can take them to a place so that they're, I can redirect them safely. And that's um, that magnetic force I feel is a natural thing that, hap- that can happen. I want to explain in Roku. So in Roku is the concept of drawing your partner to you. It's the attractive force where you draw out and lead your uke to you so you can become unified. O Sensei, I believe, said that Chugu is in Roku, the attractive force between you and your partner. So we keep it completely on a physical level. Maria is going to punch in. I'm going to do your iminage. So here she comes. I accept this. And then I draw her out. So we're starting to draw your uke out. Remember, this is not a, a, ra- a lift. It's actually a raise. Your elbow stays down. I'm going to step and draw, start to draw her balance out. And bring her around. And throw when she hips past me. So we can stay on the um, periphery and just stay with an external look. Or we can look at other forces like gravitational force centripetal force, the spiraling force that goes down, and a few other things, a yin and yang, and a tension that you create. So when we have her here, and she punches, ha! as I draw her out, I'm thinking about drawing her around my body so that she twines around me. So this is not a pull, this is an expansion. I pivot her around the central axis, and I'm ready to throw. And then I so the attractive force is when she, I, I draw her if, with me and my center is weighted. The weighted center draws the mass of her body to me like a vortex. And when her body passes here, 
I throw her. When I create this movement, it should be one line from here to here to here. When I grab her collar, it's not just a pull, it's a spiral. And the spiral goes down into the ground while the other hand goes up. And they're actually connected. If you look, you'll see the inward spiral, outward spiral. So we have a yin and yang happening here. And when you have a yin and yang all the way to the ground, you can create a polarity. When that polarity happens, it affects your dantian, which is a sphere, not really a point. And the sphere becomes incorporated with an action potential. So if you're a young kid and you have a string and a button, I don't know if you play that game, you pull it and then it rapidly starts to coil when you give it tension. So this is um, what you're doing here, creating that tension and spiraling in. So when I give her an outward force, it's an up and out. And it feels differently. If you want to study that, it's really great. If you wanted to stay externally, that's perfect too. But the going deeper in dimension, you not only have to think of all these forces, you have to think of your focused mindset. Your mind in your imagery and your visualization can incorporate these ideas. It's really important. Focusing power. Breath power sinks everything down. And it also expands your body out. Um, centripetal force, it's an inward spiral along with a spiral that's weighted. We all know spirals um, bring heavier objects down. And so that's what you're also incorporating in this movement. Also the yin and yang and the tension that you're drawing. It creates an interesting internal feeling that's just beyond just externally doing it with nothing. So examine that if you feel like going a little bit deeper. This is how I feel about in Roku today. I may change my mind, but today this is how it feels. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, great that you also grounded it in examples that we can all refer to yeah yeah it's you know it's uh, these things these notions are a little bit um well, they can be esoteric but i, I kind of go with that um that quote and and i'm just going to take it out of context but um einstein said if you don't understand something and you cannot explain it to a beginner then perhaps you don't understand it well enough yourself so I, I think all these things sh people should have access to. They're not mysterious. I mean, you can make them look mystical and magical, but everyone has access to moving like this and, and intuiting like this and feeling and sensing. You just have to decide you want to invest in it. I think we have many capacities that we underrate, that we've learned to ignore, we've been conditioned to not acknowledge. I think we have a lot um, within everybody to be really amazing. But we, a lot of our limits are often self-imposed. How do you, do you experience limitation yourself and how do you uh, relate with uh, limitation or the way I would see limitation is doubt, would, would that be? Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I used to really be stuck in that. Um, it was really hard initially at first. <laughs> Number one, being a teacher, when my, when my sensei told me, you need to start teaching. This was back in the 90s. Uh, I was completely just didn't want to do it. And, um, and I, to be honest with you, I stayed with only two techniques for probably three years because I was really afraid of being a failure. Um, and now... I don't see it as failing. I see it as investing in information, you know. So there is no failure. I'm no longer afraid to try new things or seek out the worst okay. Because I, I, I don't expect I'll be doing things successfully, but I will be gathering information to learn how to do it better the next time. So I don't see myself as having so many limits like I used to. Um, it, I think that, yeah, I think that... Uh, going out of my comfort zone is not uncomfortable anymore. Mm. You know, and sometimes I will actually purposefully go out of my comfort zone to learn and to see if I can walk through something that feels disruptive and I can maintain an, an, an evenness and equanimity of some kind throughout. And sometimes I'm good and sometimes I'm not, but um, it's a learning. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's, that's profound. I feel like uh, as a martial artist, I often, in the more recent years, as I've I've begun to embody this, that I that one one aspects of me is is a martial artist, and I, I think a big part of that is uh, sort of a code of honor, mm-hmm. and I found myself to have it written down, and then also revise it at some point every now and then. And I think a lot of the aspects, uh, beautiful aspects about Aikido and your writing and what you're sharing is this sort of essence that we um, cultivate. And then that can take the form of these principles that are easy to refer to, but have a lot of depth and ex- years and decades of experience mm-hmm. to, yeah. to be able to walk with it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so... Well, thank you so much, and uh, I know we're, we're short on short on time. And it's such a deep, deep subject. Is there anything that you think we can we would like to speak about, or anything you would like to mention? Well, you know, I just um, want to again um, acknowledge that um, Aikido is really a, a profound martial art. Um, it's a genius art. It's it's an art that brings you to a higher consciousness. Um, and, um, and you become so mindfully aware of so many things that, that life be- takes on a whole new avenue. Um, and who would have thought that that would be incorporated in a physical art? Um, but like other things like music and art and, and writing, you can become transformed by knowing yourself, understanding yourself, and then understanding the people around you the only thing that um, that um, dissolves division is compassion, I believe. And um, once we decide to be compassionate with each other, we can look at each other's viewpoints and understand. Um, there's always impasse, but you know you can always agree to disagree, um, and then uh, and try to try to exist in a kind of a harmony that I think we have always been meant to exist in. I think it's the human condition that we need to overcome the, the need to be so competitive and so um, at, other, at other people's expense to see the human being as a beautiful thing and, and yourself as well. So, um, yeah, Aikido has been a tremendous gift. I'm lucky. Yeah, I feel blessed and uh, it's, it's been a wonderful opportunity to train under your guidance and uh, to continue to to do so. Um, yeah, so I uh, thank you again for coming and sharing with us and I look forward to more conversations if you need to have them. Yes, thank you, yes. Kenan. Thank you, so thank you Sensei.